So I am super excited to chat with Dr. Nayan Patel as we are going to have a comprehensive chat about glutathione. Really excited about this conversation. So uh, let me go ahead and dive into Dr. Patel's bio here. Uh, Dr. Nayan Patel is a sought after pharmacist wellness expert and thought leader in his industry. He has been working with physicians since 1999 to custom develop medication for their clients and design a patient-specific drug and nutrition regimen. He has been the pharmacist of choice to celebrities, CEOs, and physicians themselves, uh, not including this bio, but I, I'm pretty, you, you have a book as well. So, uh, yes. uh, yep. So definitely check out the it, glutathione revolution. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. And that's on, uh, that's also an audio book as well, I believe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Patel. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting. Yeah. Again, really excited to talk about glutathione, uh, something that a lot of practitioners use in their practice in different forms, but as far as understanding it, and then of course, just the general public. Uh, I mean, it's more and more common, but again, you're going to really go into detail. But mm -hmm. for those who are unfamiliar with glutathione, if someone is just hearing that and like, gluta what? What is that? Glutathione? Was, <laughs> can, you, can you talk about what, what it is, why it's considered to be what's called the master antioxidant? Absolutely. So if you do not know the word glutathione, you should, uh, and hopefully you'll you will get by the end of the day, day today. And the reason is because it is the most abundant peptide or molecule or any component that's produced in the human body. Uh, it is ubiquitous with anything else that you can think about it because next to water, glutathione is the most abundant molecule there is. And the reason that is produced in there is because of all the things that it does for us. You just mentioned antioxidant. So the simplest term, glutathione, is, it's, a, it's a tripeptide. That means it's the three amino acids coming together, glycine, glutamine, and cysteine. Uh, and it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the simplest uh, form of a peptide, uh, so to speak. But the uh, simplicity is, is not something to be undertaken because the work it does, uh, it's way more than any other molecule inside your body. All right. Well, thanks for the explanation. And so I, I need to ask you what motivated you to start doing extensive research on glutathione, let alone write an entire book on glutathione. So, you know, like what they say, it's uh, if there's one thing that I can do that can change the complete course of my trajectory, what would that be in medicine? Right. Uh, and when I was doing my research and everything, everything, everything led to me as to, hey, what can we do to reduce oxidative stress? What can we do to help our body heal from inside? How do we keep the body from clean from inside? And all those things. The body produces abundance of glutathione to do so. And we have known for this product for about 140 plus years. But the thing is, nobody's ever figured out how to enhance it inside your body. And so I said, okay, wait a second. We know something is good for us. We, uh, we know this is, this is the best thing there is. How come nobody has ever figured out how to get inside your body? And so I said, you know what? Let's take it on. I have some spare time. I have nothing else to do. My business was not doing great anyways. So I said, just, just, we just started working on, uh, on this project very early on, trying to figure out, uh, see how we can get this inside our body. Okay. Well, wonderful. I'm glad, glad you did. Uh, we, would, we wouldn't be having this conversation otherwise, and you wouldn't have been helping all these other people. Uh, so with your research, so thank you for that. And, and, and thanks for releasing the book as well. And sources. So let's talk about maybe starting off with food sources. Can, like, what, what sources of food can you get at least the precursors of glutathione? Or again, you mentioned some of the precursors, like you said, glycine, cysteine, glutamine. Glu yep. So, um, so those are amino acids. So like protein, I, I, I'll let you take over from you. Absolutely. So, so before I talk about sources and where we get it from, I really want people to understand why we need this thing, because if it's the most abundant molecule, 
and the why we need this part. The why is what will help you get the okay. What should what should I do now? Right. If there's no why, then people are not going to do what. What? Why would I do this thing? Right. And so I, I want to explain the why first, if if, if that's okay. Sure. Um, so the the why is because glutathione is has two purposes in inside your body. One, it detoxifies or neutralizes all the free radicals that you're exposed to. And by the way, if you're breathing, you are consuming oxygen. That's a free radical. And in low concentrations, it's great for you because it gives source. It's a source of energy and it helps your body uh, heal from inside. But excess oxygen, excess amount of oxygen can also cause what we call reactive oxygen species. And those are actually toxic to the human body. So the body produces glutathione to kind of quench all those free radicals out so it always stays low enough. But there's a second source of free radicals coming to the body is from outside environment like sun, uh, pollution, chemicals that we ingest, chemical reaction that happens inside your body. Every single reaction that happens inside your body produces a byproduct. The byproducts are all reactive oxygen species. Uh, and when you break down amino acids or proteins, it also uh, it also creates what we call is reactive nitrogen species. And so all those things have to be kind of neutralized on every single day because you eat and you breathe almost every single day. So you got to have a system in your body to constantly neutralizing all those things. So that's the first function. You 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 sleeping, you're awake. Doesn't really matter. Its body is working for you. The second part, which nobody talks about, which is 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 as much or even more important, is that it helps detoxify your liver, because your liver is like the garbage disposal of your body. Try to process every single thing and dump into the kidneys or your or the intestines, so you, you can just get rid of it from your body. But the processing requires uh, chemicals. The most the most important one is glutathione because it helps bind to all these chemicals and hopefully get rid of it. So those two processes are very, very critical for us. And so that's why we need to make sure our glutathione levels are going to be high at all times because I don't care if you're a 20-year-old or 2-year-old or a 100-year-old person. If our needs are gonna, not going to decrease as we age. Our needs are going to be the same no matter what. And so our needs, if the needs are same, if the body cannot produce it enough, then we have to make sure that we are doing everything possible to give a body the fighting chance to improve the level so that it can it can keep a body clean from inside. So the question that you asked me earlier about how do we get them in there? So the, uh, the number one choice is always going to be food, right? Which foods can I eat to get the glutathione that I need? Uh, and by the way, your body actually does not have the receptors or cannot accept glutathione by itself as is. That means we have to uh, consume all the building blocks, which is amino acids, and the body has to make it form there. And so our foods that are uh, rich in, uh, in the glycine or cysteine or glutamine are going to be great for it. But let me just tell you one more thing. A body has enough glutamine and glycine coming from all kinds of sources, all, all the food we eat. The issue is we are not getting enough cysteine in our diet. So if you just put in your favorite search engine, cysteine-rich foods, you get, get a list of if you're vegan or vegetarian or, or meat eater, it doesn't really matter. They have food choices in every categories that you have uh, to consume uh, those products to get the cysteine in your diet. Cysteine is actually getting used up by your body to produce glutathione. So that's the easiest way of doing it. But even before you go into the diet, first of all, I would suggest to reduce the toxins, reduce exposure to excessive sunlight, reduce exposure to the pollution, reduce exposure to some toxic chemicals that you may, may ingest knowingly or unknowingly, like alcohol depletes a lot of glutathione levels. Smoking can deplete a lot of glutathione levels. So avoiding the toxins, avoiding the environmental toxins and exposure to excess, excess exposure to sunlight can also reduce the need of glutathione. So that gives the body the chance to, to use it for other purposes. 
Okay, so it makes sense because you said that the two main purposes of glutathione is to help with free radicals, so essentially reducing the oxidative stress and then also detoxifying the liver. So it makes sense you want to try to do as much as you can to reduce your toxic burden as well as excess sun exposure and um, some of the other things you mentioned. So thanks for sharing that. And then food sources, mainly focusing on cysteine rich foods rather than foods, uh, so food sources of glutamine and glycine, correct? That's right. And in fact, well, I'm, I'm doing some trials right now uh, for some brain trials. And what we are finding out is people, at, even at the 70 year old people, they have abundance of glutamine uh, what we are suspecting is that glutamine might be an issue as well uh, if it's in the brain. So having a cysteine-rich diet can actually bind those excess glutamine and getting them out of the body. So hopefully that's a good thing. So cysteine-rich is food is, is what we recommend most of the time. How about just, I guess, for those who have an increase in intestinal permeability, have that leaky gut, Ah. Would, would 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 glutamine be beneficial for for those people for gut support? Absolutely. So so the glutamine again, even though glutamine is it may be too toxic in your brain, uh, but not enough glutamine can also cause all kinds of leaky gut issues and uh, permeab uh, permeability issues or cells not developing correctly. So having the glutamine source of between one to five grams a day, if you have that problem, is a great idea. But keep in mind, if you can enhance the glutathione levels in the body, it will do the same exact thing as well. And are there any symptoms associated with the glutathione deficiency? Ah, what you just mentioned earlier was oxidative stress is the, is the key component of what we're trying to reduce with glutathione. But if you look at oxidative stress, what's, what are the symptoms of oxidative stress? Well, 80% of all diseases known to mankind is related to oxidative stress. So the key is, do we want to wait until we get diseased or can we stop it from getting into the original cracks of it, right? So the idea behind this is we're not looking for symptoms at this point. All we're looking for is that, hey, do I optimize my lifestyle to the point that I am making sure that my glutathione levels are going to be high at all times? If you're looking for symptoms specifically, by the time you get diagnosed by, for example, having a high insulin load, insulin resistance, or high triglyceride levels, or, or getting Alzheimer's, or, or cancer or heart disease or any of those diseases it's too far gone right and and so the goal is do i want to treat the problems i want to avoid the problems if i want to avoid the problems then you, you have to work on your lifestyle or your, on your on your habits and so i had to figure out i said okay if that's the case do i take glutathione supplements from the day I, 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 i'm born the answer is no I'm not saying that either because you cannot supplement your way out of all the problems. And so having a better lifestyle is what I'm advocating. I want to make sure that people are reducing the exposure to the toxic, uh, known toxic chemicals and, and uh, pollutions and, and gases and things like that. And the second part is that having a healthier diet that encompasses all kinds of amino acids, not just a cysteine, but cysteine is probably the most important one for glutathione production. But by, by all means, cysteine is not one of the essential amino acids uh, that we have to take every single day. So having the essential amino acids coming from your uh, your eggs or your meats or your vegetables or whatever that is, right? Having a good source of proteins that, that your body can uh, clean it off and use uh, all the amino acids from inside is going to be a key component for it. So symptoms-wise, if you really want to hone on a couple of symptoms, uh, at the age of 30-ish is what we first start seeing the low of glutathione level. That's the first time we start seeing body getting fatigued and tired, right? Uh, in the 20s, like you're never tired ever. Right at the 30, all of a sudden, it's, oh, geez, I'm just getting not feeling that fantastic anymore. Right, so the the creepy fatigue kicks in. Sleep pattern is not the ideal one that kicks in. Uh, these are all oxidative stress markers. Right, then you have some some sort of eight spots, liver spots. Uh, 
your skin may get a little bit of discolorations and things like that. So you can see visible signs. You see you, uh, the creepy forgetfulness starts kicking in. Because keep in mind, the oxygen that you breathe in, 20% of all the oxygen that you breathe in goes to your brain first. And the brain is only 2% of the whole body weight. But yet it consumes 20% of all the oxygen. So your brain has the highest amount of oxygen stress in your whole body. Next to you, uh, after, uh, after that is liver and then, then other organs. But the first one is the brain. And so if your brain is, is, uh, is getting taxed or has too much oxygen stress, it's going to show signs of memory issues and uh, fatigue kicks in and, uh, and you're just not feeling yourself. So all those signs and symptoms are great, but please don't wait for the signs and symptoms. Start doing things, something today so you can help yourself. Makes sense. So even if you're feeling great, you still could have lower glutathione levels, have potentially a glutathione deficiency. And I'll, the audience consists of mostly people with thyroid conditions, many who have autoimmune conditions, Graves, mm -hmm. Hashimoto's. And so when you have autoimmunity, that's associated with oxidative stress. So uh, based on that, can we assume that people with autoimmune conditions of different kinds are more likely to need glutathione than others or so when patients with autoimmunity they their gluten uh, levels are actually below zero if it's just such a thing like that they, it doesn't exist in these people they are constantly deprived of of glutathione being available because the body is trying to fight a ghost and so patients with autoimmune conditions they already have it their needs of glutathione are actually extremely high. And so we have we have made a product just for those people with a higher concentration. Uh, uh, but normally, I do not prescribe that to anybody else besides people with the needs are very high. So people with severe oxidative stress, especially patients with autoimmune conditions, their needs are extremely high. The issue is that if they have not had glutathione for a while, the body has become toxic. And so if I give a high dose glutathione from the get-go, the patient's gonna have a lot of reactions, Herxheimer reactions, detox reactions. And so the first month I always say, hey, let's go slow. Let's slowly build up your levels so you have no side effects or no, no effects, uh, ill effects from this medication or from the product. And once that they are, they're better, they can tolerate uh, certain levels of dose, then they can go, go to a higher concentration work and they can see the benefits in less than six weeks. The idea behind this is that it's not going to get rid of the autoimmune conditions at all, but what it's doing is that it's preventing from your body, autoimmunity is preventing from the body to stay clean and, and, and agile all the time. And we all know, once you get one autoimmune condition, it doesn't stop at that. The body is trying to fight this issue. It doesn't, have, doesn't know what it's fighting. And so... Uh, opportunistic infections and diseases kind of kind of, kind of, kind of creeps in again. And so I, I want to make sure people understand that autoimmune diseases conditions are just not single focal point, but they are the gateway to major illnesses in the future as well. So having something like glutathione, something like a healthy lifestyle uh, to support the needs of what a body needs is going to have a fighting chance to, to keep the conditions under control or hopefully reduce the load down so the body can handle it. Okay, makes makes sense. Stress, chronic stress, does that have a negative <laughs> impact on glutathione? So when, when people talk about stress, there are two types of stresses. One, we already discussed oxidative stress. The second one is uh, endocrine stress, which is, comes from the cortisols, uh, extrapolation of cortisols or adrenalines. And those are regulated by the adrenal glands right above your kidneys, that the small glands are there. Uh, and that's those stressors are a kind of, I, I wish our body was like compartmentalized. That means uh, we nobody knows what, what the other person is doing, but our body internally is all like one giant fluid. It is crazy how things work inside the body uh, and all those liquids and they don't mix together, right? Uh, so when it comes to stressors, yes, uh, even though they are environmental stressors that's causing 
uh, excess uh, cortisol productions or excess of adrenaline coming in the body. It has a profound impact on, on inflammation. Uh, it has profound impact on cytokines, which are known uh, uh, products that helps uh, keep our body uh, in check, like the uh, all the uh, interleukins 2 and 12s, and I, I don't want to bore everybody else with that one. The cytokines are there to uh, are released by the body to help mitigate some of these problems. So when we have those things, uh, our body is actually in, in chaos. And at that time, the need for glutathione also increases at that time. So regardless of what stress you have, oxidative stress or endocrine stress or physical stress or mental stress, all those things will deplete glutathione levels some more than other, but they all have an effect on reducing the glutathione levels. So having a proper lifestyle and a diet or supplementation to improve glutathione levels is going to be key in managing any of these conditions. All right. Well, thank you for that. And testing, is there, what, what would you say is the best way to measure glutathione's uh, doing glutathione in the blood? There's also... <laughs> pyroglutamate, uh, like through urine testing? Uh -huh. So when you're measuring pyroglutamate in the urine, it's basically it's one of the metabolites or uh, it's it's not a true indicator of how much glutathione you have in the body. It's kind of assumption is how much you have in the body. So I don't do too much urine testing at all. Uh, I do serum testings, uh, but even the serum testing, there's a, there's a drawback to that one too. By the time you draw the blood, and put in a tube and just ship it to the lab, even before it leaves the office, it's already been oxidized. And so what you're really measuring is the total glutathione levels and the total oxidized glutathione levels, what you're actually measuring. Uh, in theory, you would assume that if you're otherwise healthy, the 50% is oxidized and 50% is reduced inside your body. But if you have autoimmune conditions or metabolic disorders or cancer, then you what you have is too much oxidized glutathione and very little of the reduced form. But it's very hard to measure that part. The true measurements of glutathione can come in the laboratory settings uh, or in research settings where you can draw the blood, put the blood sample in the machine right away and, and, and get the results immediately. That's the only way you can do those uh, testings to get the accurate results. Uh, so we did that part. We have done that study and in the, at the university hospital. Uh, and what we found out was the younger population, because we did the studies, I think it was med students, uh, most of the most, most of the med students and some of the professors. Most of the med students have a good ratio, 50-50 ratio of reduced versus oxidized glutathione. The professors have way too much oxidized glutathione in the body. That tells us that even though they are healthy, they're professors at a med school, they're healthy, but still the oxidized glutathione is much, much higher than everybody else out there. So uh, something is better than nothing. So if you go to test, please test your uh, blood levels and don't measure the whole blood because if it stays, the, the glutathione in the plasma doesn't have a doesn't have a good track record. So make sure you measure the blood, uh, the, the red blood cells, RBC levels of glutathione. That's the true indicative of how much glutathione you should have in your body. Okay, so so you don't pay much attention to urine testing and then blood more the RBC levels well, of glutathione. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then how about the impact of genetics, having genetic polymorphisms, which are common genetic variations, uh, that that could definitely play a role in who might need more glutathione compared to someone else? Uh, yeah, so thank God this genetic testings have gone cheaper and cheaper as the years goes by. 15 years ago, it used to cost like 5,000 bucks for full genome testings has gone down to like 500 bucks or less nowadays. So it's gone very inexpensive relatively to what it used to be. And because of that, uh, over the last 15 years, the data is coming out as to how many percent of people have gene mutations of what we call SNPs, uh, gene SNPs, that they are not either able to produce glutathione or the need for glutathione is extremely high. And so these gene snips are telling us a lot of story. 
So if you have mutations, uh, if you have a gene uh, problem to begin with, like they are born with it, uh, early on you will get the deficiency of glutathione and you're going to see signs and symptoms of spectrum disorder most of the time. People are, are either have autism or Asperger's. Not all autistics and Asperger patients are glutathione deficient, but uh, a lot of them are. And so if they're early on, you can find out, okay, there's, there's an issue over there and that that's okay. But the gene mutations that, that, that we are talking about is, is as we age, uh, we get exposure to cosmic rays, UV lights, foods we eat, uh, things like that. So some of the gene uh, mutations are, are happening afterwards, and those gene mutations can uh, uh, can change the course of how how much glutathione we actually need, or the body is able to produce them at all. So, for example, MTHFR is a very common gene mutation that we see in a lot of patients. Uh, it's not a gene mutation where your body cannot produce glutathione, but, it, it, but what happens is that because of MTHFR, they, they, they don't have enough methyl groups, they, they're not able to detoxify a lot of chemicals, and so the job for glutathione becomes, becomes extremely difficult, or the need for glutathione increases dramatically. So even though your body can produce, the body cannot keep up, keep up with the demand. So... Please, if you are, if, if if the audience is is interested in that part, I would strongly suggest that you work with a physician who knows this uh, gene SNPs. Uh, I work with a couple of doctors myself. In fact, I'm doing a presentation to a physicians group next week on gene mutations and how it's affecting glutathione levels as well. And the whole idea behind that is because the more we are finding out what these gene SNPs are doing, the better off we can prepare ourselves. We cannot change the course. Uh, we cannot change the, uh, the the mutations, but we can change how we respond to it. So working with a physician is, is critical. And typically, if you do a full, full, full genome mapping, it'll take you months to go through each and every gene mutation to see what, what should I do with that one. It's not a one-hour visit or, or a 10-minute visit. It's a probably over time, maybe like five or ten different visits to figure out every single thing out about your body. All right. Well, thank you for talking a little bit about genetics. So let's let's talk about supplements. Uh, just that's okay. of great interest to the listeners. And uh, there are different forms of glutathione supplements. And even before, I mean, besides talk about supplements, there are other ways to administer glutathione, such as IV. A, a lot of people get IV glutathione. So I'd love to know your thoughts when it comes to IV glutathione, liposomal glutathione, even taking something as simple as N-acetylcysteine, which is a form of cysteine, as you were talking about earlier when True. discussing some of the food sources. So when it comes to supplementation, it's a very confused uh, market. There's a lot of marketing going on, a lot of, a lot of hype going on with not too much data behind to back it up. And so I, I wanna make sure the consumers are, are getting information uh, and, and learning from this from, from here to see, become a skeptic for yourself and question every single thing. So that way you know that, hey, uh, you're making informed decisions. So just to let you know, first of all, uh, I think I said earlier, your body has no receptor to take glutathione as is. And so in the last, 140 plus years that we have known about glutathione, there's only one FDA approved product to improve glutathione levels, and that's NAC, n cysteine, which is a cysteine given in a capsule form. The body takes the cysteines, combines the glycine and glutamine, and it produces own glutathione. It works great, right? Uh, but the issue now we are finding out is as we age, a body is not able to uh, keep up with the demand. Of, of the some gene mutations. So there always gonna be a need for supplementations that the body can use up as is. So of course the first inclination is guess what? Let me just inject it in, 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 into the body. If I can get injections into the street of the veins, uh, my job's done. And so the study was done in 1991 where they gave two grams of IV infusion of glutathione. And what they found out was 100% of the glutathione was seen in the plasma only. Nothing entered the blood cells, zero. And so what happens that then what they do, they check further out and say, okay, where is this uh, plasma glutathione go, going? In five to 15 minutes, 
everything, uh, all the gluten was it was in the urine. And so, wow. really, IV glutathione is actually not sustaining the glutathione levels for long term. Uh, furthermore, they, they, they continued the study for another few more hours. And what they saw was the body broke down the glutathione into various amino acids. And the system was seen, uh, optical system was seen in the blood, like I think about a couple of hours later. And so what the what the researchers basically come to a conclusion is that when you infuse glutathione, the body breaks it down, absorbs cysteine, cysteine is getting used to produce the glutathione again. That was the conclusion that the body that the researchers came with it. So, anyways, that, that was the research on on IVs. But even today's date is very popular, and I, as a pharmacist, I am guilty of doing that as well. Because for 20 years, I was also making intravenous glutathione to sell to the doctor's offices to infuse them in the patients because that's the only option I had. So the second option that came to me was in 1999 uh, is to say, hey, can you make some liposome form of glutathione? The researchers that have the, the hold the patents of liposome technology already had some drugs in the market through FDA approval process. And so they gave us they gave us the technology and said, hey, can you use this to make some nutraceuticals like vitamin C or glutathione or CoQ10 and things like that? And so sure enough, we we made some products um, and we gave back to the researchers. And so he sold the product to some other company. One thing he could not sell off is the glutathione because it actually did not work. And they couldn't figure out what was happening. Uh, it, it worked like four weeks later, but not right away. I said, but, but something else is, needs to be happening. And so in 2011, University of Texas did a study uh, on 26 kids. And they were given the lipo liposome form of glutathione, both oral and transdermal. And what they found out was, again, same thing. Nothing was in the blood cells. 100% was in the plasma. And the plasma was breaking down all this glutathione into amino acids. They saw increase in cysteine and glutamine and glycines and taurine. And all those amino acids went up. And so the researchers came to the same exact conclusion that the body actually does not absorb glutathione. It breaks it down, absorbs the cysteine, and is later used, cysteine is later used to produce glutathione again. And so all the research that's out there so, told the same thing. And so when I started doing my research, I said, you know what? I need to figure this thing out because if the body doesn't have the receptor to accept glutathione, how am I going to get it, right, In, inside the body? And so we figured out that uh, your body has a receptor to accept uh, dextrin, like sugar molecules. And so what I did was I took the sugar molecules, made into a ring structure, and put inside the ring a glutathione molecule. So the body thinks this, this is a sugar, it takes it, inside is glutathione. And so I put a Trojan horse inside the dextrin molecules. And this dextrin, by the way, has no properties of increasing uh, sugar or glucose levels in your body. It's not for that purposes. It's a simple carb, uh, it's, it, but it's not a, it doesn't raise uh, blood glucose levels at all. And so that's our technology. When we discovered the technology for the first time in 2007, it was too premature. We couldn't figure out, I said, well, now what? How much do I give you? How often do I give you? How am I, how am I going to get the studies? What, what do I need to do this thing? So it took me three or four more years to figure that portion out. So we figured out that, hey, I can give you twice a day, about 100 milligrams, and I got the results that I'm looking for. So that, that's what we did. But then the results, they say, okay, how fast do I see the results? The absorption through your skin was literally within 15 to 20 minutes. Right at 45 minutes, we already see uh, blood levels rise to the high normal into the blood cells, into the red blood cells. So that's when we figure out, okay, this is this is nuts, right? Took me another 13 more years to figure out what conditions can I give it to, how often do I give it to it, and all I in all my research before I release the product to the open public is is all I was trying to figure out is that if I improve the glutathione levels. Does it reduce oxidative stress levels? And if I reduce oxidative stress levels down, does it have a trickle down effect to all those major diseases? Because the, the question is, we always look for say, hey, I have diabetes. Can I reduce the blood sugar levels down? Well, 
if I just, just because I reduce the sugar levels down, doesn't mean the insulin load is gone. You still have a huge insulin resistance problems. You're still going to die of some complications of diabetes. So my goal has always been, can I reduce the oxidative stress down on one end? And if I do that on one end, does he have a positive impact on these major diseases? And so that's that's what I've been researching all this time. We have a couple of published articles already done uh, that by reducing oxygen stress levels down, it can, in fact, Im improve your immune system to get rid of an, of an infection like mycobacterium. So we already published that study out. Uh, and so our goal has always been is to don't go after a Band-Aid. If I can fix the problem on the far back, can I see a positive impact on what the problem that you're facing today? And yes, we can. Some things takes time. Some things may take two days and some may, some may take six months. But regardless, oxygen stress, if I can reduce it down, has a profound impact on every diseases that are linked to it one way or another. So that's the technology that we have. It's a topical spray. That's what we use for right now. We just we have launched the company as a 2020, and I'm, unfortunately, it was just bad timing. <laughs> uh, the whole world was shut down, not just us, and we're just back in business as of last year again. All right, wonderful. Yeah, sorry about that, the timing, but I'm glad <laughs> you uh, persisted, and, and that's great that it's available. So it's a topical spray, and so it sounds like, so with both, IV glutathione and the liposome, liposomal Absolutely. glutathione. It sounds it sounds like that the glutathione actually isn't getting into the cell. It's more just like the cysteine. The body's just utilizing the cysteine. So it sounds like if you're gonna choose, like, so your your product would be the most bioavailable, the topical spray. Next to that, rather than what would be NAC, maybe NAC. something just rather than spending the money on. IV glutathione and, and liposomal glutathione is pricey as well compared to NAC too. Exactly. And the thing is, if, you, if you're going to take NAC, that, that's how I always say, just Google or just put in your favorite search engine, uh, cysteine rich foods, and just make the products for daily routine. You know, because as a supplement, you can only take a supplement once a day, twice a day, right? And and you always think as that as a supplement versus food, you don't see this as a, as a supplement. The food, you see them as, okay, I have to eat any, any day, so might as well eat, eat an avocado every day or eat uh, Brussels sprouts or chicken or turkey or whatever, right? All those things have glutathione, all those things have uh, cysteine in there. And so you personally, so you try to do as much through food. How many times per day, like with the topical spray, do you use it then like consistently once or twice a day on a wellness basis? Yes, I do. I'm at the age group. I'm 50 plus now. And so my needs for glutathione are always going to be there. Uh, today, I'm in a better shape than I was five years ago when I first started taking glutathione five years ago. Uh, I'm in a much, much better shape today than I've ever been. Uh, I, I don't know. I just have too much energy. I travel more, probably up close to 37 weeks out of the year. I'm always on the road. Uh, I'm never tired because of that. I get frustrated sometimes because... Uh, going through the TSA pre-checks, all those things are just, just frustrating sometimes. But besides that, my energy level is always very high. I perform, I, I talk, I lecture, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm always full of energy. So I do take it twice a day myself, personally. Uh, but but besides that, I, I, I make sure my diet is full of the amino acids that I need. Uh, there's, nothing, there's nothing to replace a diet. So please make sure the diet is good enough to get all your amino acids in. Uh, and then the supplementation is just an extra bonus to it. Yeah, definitely agree with that. Um, what what the supplement, can can you take it with food or are you supposed to take it away from food? So this is a topical product, so it doesn't really matter. <laughs> it, the food has nothing, has zero okay. impact on it at all. Uh, in fact, since it's topical, we always say that apply on a clean skin. So that means before you apply the product, make sure you uh, clean the skin off, uh, make sure there's no debris in there because uh, we want to make sure that the product is has a has a good chance of getting inside your body without having to, having, having to deal with some uh, debris on your skin or dead skin sometimes too. 
How about if someone takes NAC, like, yeah. are because are, I usually recommend taking it away from supplements, but is it, ne or not supplements, away from food, but is that necessary if someone took it with the meal? Would that no, be okay? Or? It should be okay. NAC is pretty, very, very easily absorbed. Uh, so I would not worry about NAC at all. You can take it with food, without food, uh, with with drinks, uh, coffee and tea and things like that. I, I, I don't think so that's going to be an issue taking NAC with anything. Yeah, and, and it's not so much the bioavailability. Some say if you take it with other foods with protein, it will compete with the other amino acids. So again, I'm not sure if that's... If no, I mean, the bigger issue we have today more than anything else is, is the pH of your stomach uh, because most Americans uh, today are taking some sort of products to reduce the acid reflux, antacids or some sort of form of that, uh, or drinking alkaline water and really uh, re uh, increasing the pH of the stomach. The, the pH of the stomach has to be between one and two to unfold the protein. And then you need the enzymes to, to chop the protein off into various amino acids. But if you're taking alkaline water, if you're drinking, uh, if you're taking antacids, the pH of your stomach is rising. And because of that rising pH, the, they cannot unfold the protein. If you cannot unfold the protein, you cannot chop the protein down and absorb the amino acids. That to me is a bigger issue than taking NAC with the food at this point. Okay, now that sounds good. And so you want to have a lower pH, of course, sufficient oh, yes. stomach acid, very important for breaking those down. And then getting back to your product, you mentioned for autoimmunity, you start people slower, but you said there's another product. So it's also a topical spray, but just it's a the same high thing. potency. Uh, I'm sorry to give this shameless plug to myself. It's the product name is called Glutaril. And we have Glutaril and Glutaril Plus. The plus version is about 1.75 times stronger than the regular stuff. Uh, I would say all the work that I have done, every single thing that I've done is on the regular Glutaril. Uh, but as you can imagine, I have patients that were suffering from uh, chronic uh, oxidative stress that have led to multiple diseases, multiple conditions that uh, regular strength is not going to cut it, cut it for them. And so I had to make something stronger for them. Uh, and the stronger version is good for three to six months, maybe a year. Uh, and, and after that, they, they all switch back to the regular glutarol for maintenance anyways. Because that's that's all they need to to maintain the levels high enough in your body. Okay. Uh, anything else that you want to discuss when it comes to glutathione? Anything I should have asked you that I didn't ask you? Uh, I think you you're pretty thorough in terms of your questions. Uh, one thing I would definitely want to like like to let people know that if you read glutathione and oxidative stress it will sound like this is better than snake oil and it, and, it, and it is it is but keep in mind that it's only as good as how you treat the rest of the body with the rest of the habits you have so if you have good habits to begin with and you don't have to have to begin with but you work getting good habits uh, you, you you work towards eating the right foods, uh, fruits and vegetables, and everything that's necessary for your body to sustain a life. Uh, and having a glutathione level to reduce oxidative stress, I believe that's the best chance we have to improve our health span, because improve the lifespan is only only there if we can improve the health span. Uh, and the question that I get all the time is, do you consider glutathione as a longevity drug? Right, I get these questions all the time, and I say, always, always say, if you see about longevity drug, the true longevity drug that had ever been discovered was penicillin. Penicillin in the 40s raised the life expectancy from 40 some years of age to almost 55, 60 years of age, single handedly, because now we can get rid of infections. But that's by all means not a longevity drug. All we did was what? Improve the health span or the health of the human being. So I'm saying the glutathione is not a longevity drug per se, but it's definitely going to improve your health span. And if I can do that part, there's a potential that we can live longer, healthier without being in a nursing home.
So that's my hope for everybody else. All right. Wonderful. So Dr. Patel, where could people find out more about you, learn more about your work? And if they're interested in purchasing the glutathione product that you offer? Uh, so my website, aurowellness.com, A-U-R-O wellness.com. I spend a lot of time and energy in uh, writing the blogs. So please subscribe to my blogs and get yourself educated. The idea behind this thing is uh, I want to make sure that people make informed decisions for their life. Uh, and so I want to bring information out to them. And I'm always doing some research. So if anything that new comes out into my in, in my database, I'm going to send it out to through the through, uh, through the newsletters to everybody. So uh, so subscribe to the newsletter. Uh, we do about, maybe about two to three times a month. Uh, and hopefully that's good information for you to learn from. All right. Well, thank you. I'll make sure to put the information in the show notes and really appreciate you taking the time to chat about glutathione. Uh, really enjoy this conversation, Dr. Patel. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much.